I mean, uh, I feel, feel a bit awkward now <laughs> after this uh, wonderful and deep thematic introduction by the executive secretary. I mean, as I was listening to him, I was asking myself, what am I doing here? <laughs> And uh, I actually even thought that uh, perhaps what we should do today, after listening to Godwin, is to take a day off just to reflect uh, on what he said, uh, because it captured actually the essence of what we've been trying to do, we've been doing over the past uh, almost 10 years or five years. Um, and uh, it somehow felt like uh, reading uh, a very good review of your own book where you, you say to yourself, so this is what I meant on it. Um, but uh, of course, uh, we have to soldier on. Uh, we have to work, and uh, I'm very glad that uh, we had this uh, uh, very good introduction because it set out the issues that we want to address. Uh, there are a few things I would like to say before I move into the presentation that I prepared for, uh, for today. Uh, the first thing is really about the the culture that we are trying to develop in this uh, summer school. Uh, so we have resource persons. Uh, one is not yet here. He will join us later in the week. He's always been uh, with us. He's my colleague from the University of Basel, uh, Ralf Weber. He's a philosopher, political scientist, and a sinologist. And uh, he's Swiss and South African, or oh, South African and Swiss. <laughs> and um, he will be joining us uh, later in the week. Um, and uh, I'm also uh, very happy uh, that Ney uh, from Sher Anta Diop University uh, is also with us uh, for, for the summer school. Uh, and. Uh, what I wanted to say as far as uh, the faculty is concerned is that we are not here as lecturers. We are not teachers. Uh, we are here uh, to give you some inputs uh, so that you can carry on the work that you've been doing of thinking. So we want to be able to stimulate your thinking. That's all we want to be able to achieve. So it's not like we are going to give you new content, uh, that we are going to be sharing uh, new ways of looking at things. That's not the ambition. Uh, the ambition is uh, to be perhaps even provocative enough so that uh, you can carry on the work that uh, you have been uh, doing. So actually, if I see a lot of people nodding uh, in agreement, I'll be disappointed. <laughs> because that's not what I want to achieve here. Uh, I want you to disagree, uh, right? Within limits, of course. Um, I want you to uh, take up what we will be sharing with you and engage, engage critically with it, uh, reflect especially on what it means to the work that you're doing and um, you know how you can make it fruitful to what you're doing and how what you're doing can have an impact on whatever we say to you from here. So perhaps I could uh, um, avail myself of that particular comment to make a critical comment on uh, the introductions that were done in the previous session. 
which I found uh, interesting because I got to know you a little bit. And uh, I think uh, Godwin set up a trap because he said to you, uh, you should uh, perhaps say something about how you wish to be remembered. Not that you are passing away soon, but <laughs> right. And, and I found the responses very interesting. But the one response which I was hoping to hear and I didn't hear uh, was the one that engaged with your own work. You see, we do academic work because we want to make a contribution to knowledge, right? So when we write a PhD thesis, uh, we are not writing the PhD thesis in order to have an answer to our research question. We are writing the PhD thesis in order to have a bigger question, right? Um, and that bigger question is the question that takes us forward in knowledge production. So I was hoping to, to hear you saying, you know, uh, I want to make a contribution to my particular field by drawing attention to this particular aspect that uh, uh, people have not yet considered. I mean, uh, it's okay, you have time. <laughs> so don't worry, uh, there's, there's enough time for you to catch up. Uh, but I, I really hope that you can use this opportunity that uh, Codestria is giving us uh, to talk to one another here, really to think about how you think the particular thing you are doing will contribute to your particular field. What is that thing that you are adding to your field of knowledge? You know, uh, what is it that we will be able to see much better, you know, uh, with the results of your work? Yeah. Uh, so there are sociologists here, there are anthropologists, political scientists, uh, philosophers. Uh, how do you hope uh, your field will be changed by the work that you are doing now. I think we need to have that ambition. And I think that's really what uh, Godwin Murunga was talking about uh, when uh, he was emphasizing the importance of what we are doing here, the uh, methodological importance of what we are doing here. I think he was trying to draw our attention to the importance of developing an ambition. We have to. You know, we have to develop an ambition. So this, uh, uh, this um, um, very famous, uh, very brilliant uh, Cameroonian uh, philosopher who unfortunately passed away, uh, Fabien Ebusi Bulaga, uh, who used to say, you know, if we as Africans want to survive, we have to do philosophy in earnest. Yeah. We have to do philosophy in earnest. And I think that applies uh, to all fields of knowledge. And doing science in earnest means developing an ambition to change things. You know, we need that. That's, that's very important. So that's one of the things that um, we want to be able to foster uh, in these days that we will be uh, together. So that's, uh, that's one of the things I wanted to say as a preface to everything else that we are going to do today and uh, the rest of the week. Um, this is not going to be a lecture now. It will be um, an opportunity for, for me to listen to your views uh, I will be giving you some inputs and, uh, you know, we will see how uh, the whole thing develops. I brought here, um, let me see, okay, 
I brought here pictures of objects. And um, actually, uh, these are pictures that I took in Basel. There is uh, a museum in Basel, in Switzerland. Uh, it's called uh, uh, Museum of uh, Cultures. I think uh, it started as an ethnological museum as things go. But now it's, it's simply a museum of cultures. And I'm on the board of that museum. So I've, uh, uh, this year I've started visiting the warehouses of the museum together with the director of that museum. And we, what we do, we just go and pick up a few objects and uh, we talk about them. Well, we just pick a few objects and then we start discussing, the two of us, for like two or three hours. And then it's like uh, smoking dope and then we are fine and we go home. <laughs> right, but we behave, <laughs> right, we behave, right. So I just wanted to, you know, <laughs> right, good. <laughs> you know, I thought we could just uh, discuss the, the pictures. Um, you know, what do you see? Or what do you think you see there? Um, do you think the objects are speaking to you in any particular way? Are there things you would like to say to the objects? Okay, I'm all ears now. Um, so m maybe I should entice you. Uh, you know Switzerland is uh, famous for chocolate. So the first person who contributes will get Swiss chocolate <laughs> next time. Next time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so go ahead. I like the idea of academic dope smoking, although I suppose the real thing is even better. But uh, <laughs> when you say ethnology, I do understand the depth that you are inviting us to go to. But um, I could speak to any one of them, but let me go to, I don't know, left the one. Um, I think um, just this, for me, Whenever somebody say technological advancement, I always start here because this is technology that was used to enslave. This is technology that was used in such violent ways that were justified and justifiable in a particular point in time. And as such, as one who was um, shocked into anthropology in so many ways, um, these are some of the things that I question as a matter of instinct, precisely because I also draw from this idea that our bodies, um, it was uh, brought to me, Didier Fassan, I'm sure you know him, uh, who was also my mentor at some point. <laughs> Uh, you know, this notion about bodies remembering, which um, for me was his way of shutting down the South African white voice about um, the, how they were reading HIV in South Africa, which for us was um, a very uh, um, defining moment. So um, for me, technology coming from UNISA, whereby we are supposed to be technologically advancing 
my instinct is always, uh, my body always remembers that while we may posit technology to be uh, benign and un unharmful, in fact, technology can, and in the ways that it's being spoken about, is very harmful. And I try to balance that with the acknowledgement that Africans also have, do have technologies, and how then might those um, sit side by side. So one of the reflections that we made uh, from this morning's um, uh, uh, reflections by uh, Godwin was, uh, Lerato was saying that uh, the spiritual part of it didn't come through. And I said my, re my reaction was that knowledge is also ontological. So um, I will pause there. That's my piece. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much for that. Uh, you see, uh, we are writing in our topic, you know, because there we have a piece of technology. And uh, what we are being reminded here uh, is that, uh, you know, technology is not innocent. So you cannot approach uh, something like that as if it were not also speaking a normative language, an ethical language. It's there, right? So the question is always, uh, how do you bring that out? Uh, how do you make the piece of technology, you know, which is just an artifact, uh, how do you make it, uh, you know, uh, speak about where it is speaking from <laughs> and about uh, what it is saying to us, right? There's another story there, and that story is that Technology is a concept. That is, uh, it is a, a resource uh, which we use uh, to be able to describe reality, to be able to describe the world, right? Uh, and concepts define us as academics uh, because concepts are, are our main working tool. We cannot do our work without concepts. We need concepts to do our work, right? And immediately the question that arises there uh, is whether uh, the concepts which we use are simply describing things out there or whether the concepts that we use are actually producing things out there. Right. That's a very difficult uh, question, which I think we should address in this uh, summer uh, school. Um, now, what that means uh, is not only that technology is not innocent, but also that concepts are not innocent, right? And that it would be a problem to neglect that. Uh, to fail to pay due attention uh, to that particular aspect. Okay, I think that was a really good uh, s start. Uh, she has won her chocolate. <laughs> no more chocolate now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any more? Thank you. Um, mine is a question more than anything uh, because uh, I think going back to what Prof. Uh, Noctula has just highlighted there, most of us, I would like to assume, were all struck uh, by the shock factor of the last technology that you highlighted because in all honesty, everything there is technology to an extent, but their level of technology and what they've been used to execute are totally different and on different scales, you know. So I have a question that uh, as to why that one specifically was there because I feel as though it is on the extreme, like shock factor side of things. So I just want to get that because I think 
in general, most of us would be would see that, you know. So it, because it becomes easier for us to be able to do an analysis once we have that out of the way. No, that's very good. Uh, except that it's me asking questions this morning. <laughs> That's, that's very good, nice try. Um, but, but yes, uh, I, I mean, uh, you know, uh, I am interpreting your question in a slightly different way now. Uh, I am interpreting your question as an attempt that you are making to make sense of this thing here so that you can be able to give an account of what you see. And that's what we do all the time. You know, when we do academic work, that's, that's what we are always struggling to do, right? Now, I can, I can tell you any story, right? And based on that story, you will be able to produce a narrative, your narrative, which is going to be different from her narrative, right? And then we are going to have many narratives. And the problem often, in scientific work is that we are somehow committed to the idea that if we do our work well, we will end up with the same narrative, right? And we fail to see uh, that often uh, our work, what it does is that it gives us an opportunity uh, to discover many possible worlds. You know, so actually, uh, one of the most interesting things about doing social science, uh, especially here in Africa, uh, is uh, to come to realize that there are many possible worlds. And what is strange is that we all struggle to produce similar accounts. Uh, and so, my suspicion is even that the way we work with concepts um, is somehow geared uh, towards uh, sustaining an illusion. You know, we have an idea of the world and we somehow think that uh, we have to sustain that idea, uh, that we have to end up producing that uh, that particular idea of the world. And we fail to see all the possible worlds uh, that are somehow entailed uh, in, you know, uh, in what we see. Uh, I mean, I, I told you this is taken from a museum. Now, that is a way of limiting your reading of those things, you know, by simply telling you that. So, okay, uh, any more? <laughs> yes, please. Oui, merci. Bon, euh, madame, elle était du côté gauche. Je veux aller à l'opposé, à l'extrême droite. Mais je ne suis pas pour les Nations Unies quand même. <rire> Alors, à l'extrême droite, on a deux images. Je vais commencer par le, la première image qui est un canari. Euh, ce canari a particulièrement une propriété intéressante et cette propriété a inspiré aujourd'hui la technologie vers les réfrigérateurs et les congélateurs. C'était utilisé, c'était le principal récipient pour refroidir l'eau et la boisson. Et au-delà de ça, ça a servi sur la construction traditionnelle, l'architecture bioclimatique. À l'époque, pour faire face à la chaleur, on s'est servi des propriétés de la canari, du canari pardon, pour construire à base de l'argile, qui est aussi élément primaire. Et on a eu des constructions qui étaient formidables, qui résistaient à la chaleur. Et aussi, la technologie est venue, on connaît les CFC, que dégage tout ce qui est réfrigérateur, congélateur, climatiseur. Un peu en bas, c'est aussi très intéressant, c'est le raffia. C'est le début de la mode. 
tout a commencé par là. Je pense que c'était avec les feuilles de, des palmes, palmiers aux palmes, ou en tissu pour concevoir des raffias qui étaient non seulement tenues, qui est devenu l'indicateur culturel, tenue traditionnelle, et qui a évolué aujourd'hui aussi. Il y a des gens qui l'ont perpétué dans beaucoup de modèles. Je pense au Ghana, je pense en Afrique du Sud, je pense au Nigeria qui est un modèle un peu modéré, adapté aussi à la technologie. Donc les deux aussi, c'est les symboles culturels, mais qui ont beaucoup inspiré dans l'évolution de la société, qui ont beaucoup inspiré pour la société d'aujourd'hui. Voilà ce que je pourrais apporter sur les deux images de droite. Merci. Very good. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. And, and again, um, I just want to um, stress uh, an aspect that I take from what you said. Uh, and that is what, you know, your account tells us something about uh, what we have in common as human beings. But at the same time, the very moment that you are saying this is what we have in common, uh, you are also placing yourself in a position to make fundamental differences among people, right? Uh, and the simple way that you can do that is first of all by placing that in the museum, you know, because the museum is the repository of the past. And so you are saying that uh, the people who use those things belong to that time, right? So they don't share the present with us. So they're different. And maybe they also deserve a different kind of treatment, right? Uh, so uh, we can use concepts also to manipulate time. And the manipulation of time is quite central to the production of essential differences. So some of the things that Godwin Morunga was talking about, uh, about, um, um, you know, the, the way that Africans were dehumanized can be accounted for precisely in those ways. You know, how concepts can be used to manipulate time and how through that you can produce differences and then accounts that uh, justify uh, whatever treatment you want to meet out uh, to people, right? So very, very, very good what you uh, said. I actually have a, a, um, a special relationship to, to the raffia sk skirt. Uh, be, um, okay, I don't want to give too much away, uh, but um, that skirt is used in my country, in Mozambique, uh, for a very special kind of dance uh, by women. It's mainly women. That dance is called Shingoman. Shingoman uh, is a Tsonga word uh, for uh, a small drum, right? A small drum. So women dance to the sound of a small drum. That's why it's called Shingoman. Um, and uh, so as a 10-year-old, um, so that was in 1975, I was picked up uh, in the town where I lived in Mozambique, where I was born, Shai Shai. That's 200 kilometers north of Maputo. Uh, I was picked up uh, because I was the most handsome boy then. <laughs> so I, I was picked up uh, to give like that as a gift of the city of my uh, of the city of Shai Shai uh, to. Uh, the uh, future president of Mozambique who was on his triumphal uh, tour from the north of the country uh, to Maputo to proclaim the independence of Mozambique. So Samora Machel. Um, and he even, you know, I just want you to be envious of me. Uh, he even uh, uh, picked me up and uh, asked me to kiss him which now when I remember it's quite embarrassing, uh, but, 
Right, ok. <laughs> ok, ¿any more? Yes, please. Thank you. I just want to make a quick comment because first when you showed us the pictures, my head went to like, why are we looking at this? And I tried to relate it to the theme. Uh, but then the second thought I had, especially when my brother was speaking right now, is the fact that when we see these artifacts in museums, they're simplified and reduced to perhaps one aspect of it. And that is how I view African studies, like the simplification and the account of our lives is always reduced and it's just one thing. When in reality, like just in the pictures alone, there's this like at the bottom, uh, the, the top right, for example, th that's an artifact you can find in different parts of Ethiopia. It means different things if you're traveling to different places. And some places it's just something you keep in the house and other places it can be used as like a mug. So, I, but I, I realize like if you go to a Western museum or even at times museums within our cities, it's just simply one thing. And that's how I feel African studies and the study of Africa and Africans is like constrained basically. Thank you. Uh, that's that's really interesting. P perhaps we we can um, approach that from uh, the perspective of how we observe things, right? And and I think uh, one basic way in which we observe things is always to keep moving uh, from the particular to the general, and from the general back to the particular, right? So. Uh, everything that we see is always a representation of itself, but also of something, right? So, uh, yes, you can uh, take a concept like Africa and conflate it, reduce it to an essence, right? And you can do that in many ways. So you can do it in the problematic way that uh, we observe, and Godwin was talking about that, you know, uh, or basically producing a representation of the continent uh, which is functional to the reproduction of power over us. You know, so that's uh, 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 Valentin Mudimbe's uh, thesis on the invention of Africa. It's uh, what Edward Said was talking about when he wrote about Orientalism. Yeah. Uh, but also, uh, you can look at that conflation, that reduction, as a way of clearing up room for you to be able to speak for yourself. Uh, so yes, uh, the concept of Africa can be problematic uh, as the representation of a particular, yeah, but it can also be emancipatory. If you are using that, to clear up space to be able to speak. You know, so the, uh, what our colleagues from the Indian subcontinent used to say, can the subaltern speak, right? So of course they were not, you know, they were not saying we cannot speak. What they were saying was uh, that we have to make room to be able to speak. And of course the even more important question is not whether the subaltern can speak, uh, but whether we can make ourselves heard. You know, that's even more important. Okay, yeah. Merci. Uh, à première vue, moi je me suis posé une question. Pourquoi ces images? Et quand je me suis demandé ça, j'ai tout de suite compris qu'il y a une part de subjectivité même dans nos, dans nos recherches. Lorsque nous, nous voulons, d'abord dans le choix déjà de nos thématiques, parmi tant d'autres, et même lorsque nous, nous, trouvons, nous trouvons des hypothèses et des objectifs à nos recherches, c'est qu'il y a toujours une part de subjectivité qui définit en réalité ce que nous voulons. Et lorsque nous prenons les données que nous étudions, les données qui entrent en ligne de compte de nos études, c'est que nous en sélectionnons aussi. Donc, euh, il y a forcément une part de subjectivité dans tout ce que nous faisons, qui en même temps montre que c'est notre recherche et nous sommes 
d'une manière ou d'une autre libre de prendre la direction que nous voulons pourvu que ça nous permet d'aller vers les objectifs que nous voulons atteindre. Maintenant, par rapport aux images, je voudrais rejoindre un peu Vanel du Togo. Mais moi, je vois plutôt une calebasse. La première image à, à gauche, oui. Je vois plutôt une calebasse, contrairement à, à Vanel qui a vu un canari. Moi, je vois une calebasse. Et au Bénin, ça peut s'utiliser, c'est-à-dire ça dépend de, de la région d'où tu viens du Bénin, c'est-à-dire l'usage qu'on en fait. Il y en a qui l'utilisent pour prendre de l'eau, pour, pour décorer. Ça sert aussi de décoration, ça dépend. Et quand je viens, quand je prends l'image juste en bas, c'est un peu ce que vous aviez dit chez moi, ça, ça s'utilise pour des danses traditionnelles. Ça s'utilise pour des danses traditionnelles. C'est vrai qu'il y a un côté, disons, pour la beauté ou pour euh, l'esthétique. Les gens l'utilisent peut-être pour... OK. Les gens l'utilisent pour faire de... Disons, quand on veut faire un modèle, pour mettre des pailles et autres dedans. Donc, euh, voilà ce que je voulais apporter comme contribution. Merci. Very, very good. Uh, thank you, thank you for that. And, and, and again, uh, I, uh, I'm glad that you raised an issue that was also raised by Godwin Murunga here uh, concerning subjectivity, you know. And uh, of course, uh, we like to think of ourselves as uh, people who are engaging in knowledge production, uh, you know, uh, respecting objective standards of doing that, yeah. And uh, maybe that's, uh, that's not in itself a bad ideal to have because we want to be able to understand one another. And, and so if we were all subjective, it might be difficult to understand one another or at least to have criteria for the validation of what we are seeing. So that's, that's a big issue, right? I don't think that this is an issue that we can approach in a light-hearted manner, right? We need to think about that. But you, of course you are right in uh, pointing out uh, that it's almost next to impossible uh, to approach whatever we approach without that element, you know, of, uh, of our own individuality. And that means, you know, all the experiences that make us as people, right? All the experiences that go towards enabling us to see things in the way that we see them, right? And sometimes uh, university is a space uh, where we are trained uh, to abandon who we are in order to see things in, you know, in intelligible ways, you know, in ways that are intelligible to other people. And that's a huge, a huge challenge, yes. And, and here again, sometimes the choice of words uh, can be tricky, of course. Uh, so, for example, all of us, uh, and you've just done it, and I do it all the time, uh, we would say, you know, this is traditional dance and not local dance or not uh, national dance, or, you know. And, of course, uh, you are not wrong in doing that. We are not wrong in saying this traditional dance because uh, the concept of tradition uh, has got a meaning which warrants the use that you are making. But at the same time, if we look at it from a normative, ethical position, you know, then we can begin to see problems uh, with that particular concept. And of course, this is not to say that because of the potential of problems, in the use of concepts, uh, we should not use certain concepts. Of course we should, right? 
But we, when we say we need to be critical, uh, what we mean is that we need to be aware uh, of the potential problems uh, in the words that we choose to describe, uh, to describe things. So that's, that's very, very interesting, uh, what, you've, uh, what you've said. So I'll take two more uh, there and here, and then we are done. Yes, that's you. Good. Uh, is, is it still morning or afternoon? I'm not sure. But uh, uh, coming from a, a black theology uh, um, perspective, I, I've been sitting here trying to make sense. And uh, the very first thing when you told the story of all these this pictures, I thought about Black Panther, the very first scene of Black Panther, where this guy walks into this museum in the UK, and this, this white woman is describing this African uh, uh, um, stuff like this to, you know, and then he asked this question, so how did these uh, artifacts get here? Do you think that your ancestors asked for them very nicely, or there was a blood, blood that was spilled of my ancestors for you to have this. So that's where for me, I, start, I, I began, why in Switzerland? Why in, you know, because probably the, the, a 10-year-old, um, Ama 2000, we say in South Africa, they don't even know what this, this means. So what does that mean about African knowledges, you know? And, and African studies, uh, is it really, you know, are we really going to go somewhere or because this is still there in, in Switzerland. And now the debate has even changed because we are questioning now. They, it, it, it's being politicized, you know, to make it, um, give reasons why it must still be there, you know, being invited in their own table. So that's what came into my mind. And, uh, but secondly, uh, when I thought of now, again, trying to make sense of it from a theological point of view, you know, um, because my passion in my work is always the question of uh, are we worshipping wrong gods, you know, uh, when is the African god or the black god can stand, and I see the very first picture and I think of its cause, you know, when there's a ceremony, you're speaking to your ancestors, they use that uh, in Jolie, in its cause, like someone who tastes that alcohol, they will use that spoon to give it to the ancestors first and then you know and taste it and uh, uh, and so it made me think uh, like how do we think about this uh, knowledge power and spirituality you know and and also i'm not sure this one is that a teeth or something yes you know and then when i thought about being a tooth also it brings me back why is it there there's always spiritual aspects of it you know, and then it brings me to Chimamanda when uh, you can find your own God in a museum in Europe. So what does that say to us? Because that tooth for me represents actually exactly God in a sense. Because that is done, maybe there's a ceremony, you know, in the Sikosa culture, and a child is given that tooth, uh, you know, to go with in their necks or something. So there's a whole dreams visions that accompany that, but it's there in Switzerland, so, you know. <laughs> Very good, thank, thank you so much for that. Um, you know, I think the, the, for me, the most important aspect of what you've just said is, uh, you know, the concept of history, right, that, uh, um, things come to have meaning within a historical context. And um, you cannot describe things without describing the history within which they acquired their meaning, right? So of course, uh, what these objects tell us is the history of colonialism, right? And you cannot, you, you cannot talk about them you cannot try to make them, render them intelligible without somehow making that history relevant to your account. You know, so we're coming back uh, to this issue about the innocence of concepts. You know, concepts are not innocent. 
they are not innocent at all. Now, as for the tooth, yes, that's a lion's uh, tooth. In fact, uh, when, I, you know, when we went to the warehouse and uh, uh, the director of the museum showed me that one, um, because these are all Tonga, I mean, with the exception of the slave things, these are all Tonga objects, uh, w which is my ethnic group. And so, so I said, oh, so this is where this, uh, that's what I said to her, this is where the tooth landed, because I used to have a pet lion that lost the tooth, and we didn't know <laughs> where. Anyway. Okay. So the last one. Okay, thank you. Ce que je vois dans ces images, c'est la représentation de l'histoire de l'Afrique, de notre histoire. La représentation culturelle de ce que nous sommes vraiment, de ce que nous sommes réellement. Les traces que nos cultures, que notre patrimoine culturel disent de nous. En même temps, je vois à la fin, la dernière image à droite, je crois que ce sont des, des chaînes d'asservissement. L'histoire de l'Afrique est marquée ici par une sorte de suivisme. Nous sommes, fond, nous sommes basés sur une sorte de modélisation. Nous nous inspirons de la culture occidentale pour essayer de, en pensant, croire que c'est le modèle idéal. Pourtant, nous nous trompons. Nous abandonnons nos valeurs culturelles propres que nous produisons, celles, que nous, celles qui font de nous notre histoire véritable. En pensant être sur le droit chemin, pourtant, nous nous trompons. Et en même temps, ce joug-là qui nous, qui nous a servi davantage est en train de nous détruire. Et cette destruction est également fondée sur les études africaines. Raison pour laquelle nous, jeunes chercheurs africains, nous avons pour rôle de déconstruire ce savoir-là. Nous avons pour rôle d'apporter des valeurs nouvelles à l'histoire de l'Afrique en adoptant, des, en, 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 adoptant en réadaptant notre histoire sur la base de notre passé, de nos valeurs culturelles, de notre savoir-faire, dont les valeurs endogènes de l'Afrique doivent être remises à niveau pour essayer de nous propulser vers l'avant, pour permettre aux générations futures de se retrouver et de briser ce joug-là qui nous a servi. D'où la dernière image à droite, juste en bas. Je vous remercie. Thank you so much uh, for that. I think uh, what you are seeing to us, or my interpretation of what you are seeing, is that uh, we have a personal relationship to the things that we see, right? And uh, maybe the challenge is also to foster that relationship, you know? Now, whether um, the conclusion we have to draw uh, is that what we see is who we are or what we see is who we are supposed to be or what we see is uh, who other people say we are, right? That's, we can leave that open for the time being. Uh, that's a question that we can ask, uh, not in order to answer it, but simply, um, you know, to bear in mind, uh, to remind us again that concepts are not innocent. Yeah, concepts are not innocent. So thank you very much for uh, all the contributions. I think uh, you have captured the spirit of what we want to do this week. Um, this is what we want to do. Uh, we want to discuss and reflect our relationship uh, with the world. Uh, that relationship is mediated by language, and in particular by conceptual language. So by seeing that, we are actually suggesting that uh, there is a kind of language that has a special status. Uh, and it defines our work, it defines us as professionals, and it is the tool that we have to use in order to be able to do our work. The only problem with that uh, is, again, that that language is not innocent. 
And it's not innocent because of uh, the history that made it possible. And therefore, the meanings uh, which it forces us to purvey, right? Uh, it's not innocent uh, because it's always forcing us uh, to look at the particular and at the general and find ways of moving back and forth. Yeah? It's forcing us to relate as individuals uh, to the objects. You know? It's forcing us to ask the question uh, whether um, that language is enabling us to see things right, that exist out there or it is enabling us to make up those things. Right? Those are big questions, and those are the questions that uh, I, I would like to uh, address uh, today and in the following days. So uh, I think uh, we are going to talk about basically four things. Uh, we've already mapped them. Um, I want to talk about the canon. Um, now, this is uh, a word that should be familiar to you the Western canon, uh, that's our, our enemy here, <laughs> uh, the Western canon. Uh, I want to share a few ideas with you concerning some ways of looking at the canon. I think another concept that's uh, quite interesting to address in this connection is the concept of the West. I mean, we are always talking about the South, we talk about Southern epistemologies, and we even tend to take uh, those epistemologies and the South, the global South, we take those terms for granted, yeah? And uh, we tend to assume that uh, the notion of the West or the concept of the West has a straightforward meaning. So I want to say a few things about that. And then, of course, uh, another very important concept that we need to address is, is the concept of knowledge, you know, which is, you know, uh, what we aspire uh, to produce if we do our work properly, right? Knowledge. So what is that? Uh, and then finally, um, I will um, explain uh, something that we will be doing this afternoon in groups. So this afternoon we will have group work. Uh, you'll be sitting down and uh, you know doing something hopefully uh, interesting. Now, the canon. Um, the canon uh, is, uh, if you like, the concept which is used uh, to describe, uh, if you like, a body of knowledge uh, that is actually the framework within which we look at the world, right? Uh, of course, uh, the canon has got a very, very specific meaning, and that meaning has to do uh, with, uh, if you like, the emphasis that is placed uh, on a very particular way uh, of speaking truthfully, and uh, in an intelligible way about the world. So it is a concept that actually refers uh, to one particular world. And uh, you know, to speak from within the canon uh, is to develop the ability to speak to that particular world, right? And of course, uh, the canon is represented by very special people. You see four of them up there. Uh, you see Hegel, uh, the German uh, philosopher. Uh, you see Immanuel Kant, again, German philosopher. You see David Hume. And of course, uh, you see Karl Marx, right? And uh, what is interesting about those people uh, is that, you know, you can actually say if you are familiar with their thought, right, 
you know, you can speak in an intelligent way about the world. <laughs> now, of course, the question that we can ask is, uh, you know, how come? How come it is possible for us, you know, to speak truth about the world uh, based on the experience of those four people who are from a particular time, from a particular place, and a particular context. You know, uh, how did we come to this situation uh, that uh, we, you know, we claim to be producing knowledge uh, based on that particular canon, right? So, uh, again, uh, what I'm saying here is not to disparage. It's not to say uh, that um, whatever they said, whatever they wrote uh, is irrelevant or not uh, intelligent. Uh, I'm speaking to the context within which particular forms of knowledge came to be valued and came to be the uh, reference, the framework from within which all of us could claim to be producing knowledge. You know? and so that's the challenge that we are facing. That's, that's what I wanted to draw your attention, uh, your attention to. Now, of course, what that uh, means is that um, when we think about the canon, we are basically thinking about uh, three kinds of things. We are thinking about the world, you know? So what is the world, right? Uh, and of course, what the canon claims um, is that um, there is only one world that is possible to describe, right? That's what the canon is saying. There's only one world. So uh, acquaint yourself with the thought and the learning and the scholarship of the canon is to acquire the ability to speak meaningfully about that particular world, right? Now, of course, uh, the problem with that uh, is that of course, as we can see, and uh, you were giggling when I, uh, I uh, pointed out that, uh, you know, we can base our knowledge of the world on the thought of four people from a particular place, from a particular time, right? You were laughing when I said that. And of course, the question here is that these people are speaking from that particular place that we call the West, right? And we tend to take it for granted that the West has always existed, right? Uh, so almost as if the West were an essential and natural category. And of course it's not. I mean, the West is a recent invention. I think uh, by some accounts, uh, we could say that uh, the West was probably invented in the 19th century and uh, became perhaps uh, stronger as a, a, a concept to refer to, um, you know, within the context of the Cold War, right? So up until the 19th century, there was no such thing as the West. You know, what there was... Uh, was uh, perhaps uh, a Christian tradition, right? Uh, a religious tradition that people, uh, you know, appeal to, to make sense of their own lives, right? Um, maybe uh, up until then, uh, you had uh, different ways of looking at the world, you know, with references made uh, perhaps uh, to ancient Greece, and again to references made to ancient Greece, uh, but uh, to use uh, uh, Godwin's expression here, uh, an ancient Greece 
we, you know, weeded out, you know, of all the influences that constituted ancient Greece. So Egypt, you know, was removed from that, perhaps. Uh, the whole Middle Eastern uh, uh, context was removed from the concept of Greece. You know, of course, uh, Rome and, you know, uh, all the uh, geographical references that we can make uh, that lend meaning, a particular meaning, uh, to the concept of, uh, 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 of Greece. I, I think there are several reasons why the concept of the West uh, became important and relevant or came into being. And uh, there is where I think the social sciences are also very important. Because actually, the concept of the West has a lot to do with the emergence of the social sciences, and in particular, with the emergence of sociology. Um, I, I don't think I'm making any revelation here if I say that uh, uh, one of the things about sociology, of the emergence of sociology as a discipline in the 19th century, um, had a lot to do uh, with uh, the concern that certain scholars had to describe a new kind of society that was emerging with industrialization. You know, and in describing that new kind of society, so people like Emil Durkheim, uh, Auguste Kant, uh, in Germany, uh, Max Weber, uh, uh, and so on. So in doing that, but that of course much later, but in doing that, uh, what they were actually doing uh, was um, suggesting a language that could make it possible for us to describe a new type of society. You know, so a society that was made possible by particular historical circumstances, right? So a society uh, that also seemed to have a need uh, to differentiate itself from what had come before it. And hence you have in, in sociology this crucial distinction between tradition and modernity. It is so constitutive of sociology. And of course what you have there is not just the distinction between tradition and modernity, uh, but it is the importance of social change as a paradigm of description. Social change. So it is within that context uh, that uh, history acquires a particular meaning. So history is only history uh, if it is an account of progress. And an account of progress uh, is, uh, if you like, a description uh, of what came before and needed to be uh, overcome and uh, what came later, which is what is good, and therefore, what every society should as aspire to be. So it's that particular context that produces the West. You know, so the West, uh, if you like, uh, as uh, history, um, uh, history, uh, almost like history becoming aware of itself. Yeah. And within that framework, within that way of thinking then, um, the West uh, is not, of course, in the eyes of the people who describe it, it's not the description of a particular geographical location. It's the description of the world as it should be. You know? So when you go out to look at other societies, at other cultures, other ways of life, uh, you are always approaching them with a standard in mind. You know, uh, and it is on the basis of that standard uh, that you are able to speak in an intelligible way about other things. So that's the, that's the story we have there. So it's almost like I'm saying that the emergence of the social sciences is actually the history uh, of how we came to
to see the world as only one thing in in only one way you know uh, such that the description of whatever else uh, which is not european is always a description of what those things should do in order to become european and so that's one of the uh, if you like uh, one of the uh, of the challenges that we face as scholars uh, that um, in our own work i mean it's isn't it amazing that uh, all the attempts that we make at accounting for things in political science in sociology in anthropology it's always about talking about how africa is failing to live up to a certain standard yeah how Africa is failing to live up to a certain standard. That's how we speak about, you know, that's how we do our work. Uh, even, you know, and, and of course, often we are not conscious. We are not aware of that. We are not aware that that's what we are doing. Yeah. So, of course, I think it's fair to say that there are two, uh, there are two moments, uh, I think, in that process. Uh, and those moments can be described with reference to the so-called Enlightenment Project. You know, the Enlightenment Project is quite important because it is actually the Enlightenment Project uh, that uh, um, emphasizes this narrative uh, of a West that is consistent with the universal. And you get to know that West and how it was constituted uh, by applying reason. Yeah? So if you apply reason, you cannot fail uh, to end up with you know, uh, that conflation of the West uh, with the universal. Right? So you have that one current, but the other one is perhaps what we might describe as romanticism, uh, which was uh, particularly strong uh, in Germany, uh, which actually uh, takes a slightly different cue. So it does not emphasize reason, it emphasizes culture. You know, so it says you can only describe the world if you pay attention uh, to the culture from which that world acquires meaning, right? And of course, the problem with that uh, romantic approach uh, to things uh, is that you end up with an account of Europe uh, that uh, goes beyond, uh, if you like, the enlightenment preoccupation with reason. It actually makes the universal, um, uh, if you like, uh, an artifact of European culture, so not uh, reason, human reason, but European culture. So uh, it's, it's not simply that uh, we need to apply reason to be able to describe the world. Uh, we need to ap apply European reason in order to describe uh, the world, right? And of course, our reaction to that is also to appeal to our own culture, right? So is, instead of reacting to that by saying, uh, okay, uh, what is the human experience? Is it possible to give an account of the human experience uh, that goes beyond the local, you know, but without falling into the, you know, this ethnocentric trap, you know, which is Eurocentric actually, you know, how can we do that? We don't do that. Uh, we, uh, you know, we, we basically fall back on the same things that the Europeans are doing and we, we start extolling an essential non-Western experience which we want to present as a response uh, to what we see. And I would say that's a problem. You know, I've never understood uh, why, for example, uh, None of us, uh, none of my colleagues in academia has the ambition uh, to produce knowledge which is not simply going to solve Africa's problems, 
but it's going to make a contribution to the understanding of humanity. You know, we are the only ones in the world who are only producing knowledge on Africa, for Africa. And everybody else, everybody else is producing knowledge for Africa, for the world, and for, you know, for everyone. You know? I mean, think about your own work. Uh, what difference would your own work, each one of us here, what difference would it make to understanding the problems that France is having now? Or the war in, 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 in the Ukraine? Or, you know, there are so many things. Um, I came to this thought, actually, when there were changes, uh, you know, when the, the Iron cu Curtain um, was lifted, uh, the end of the Cold War, and uh, a lot of uh, Eastern European countries uh, embarked on structural adjustment programs. So lots of experts uh, from the West going to Romania, Hungary, Poland, and so on to advise them writing books on structural adjustment. And those of us who had gone through that here in Africa for many years had nothing to say. There was no African, you know, advising Eastern European countries on structural adjustment. There was no African writing on that. And that's amazing. You know, and, and that's what I mean by ambition. You know, ambition, intellectual ambition. We have to develop an intellectual ambition. And part of that ambition is actually uh, claiming to be able uh, to help other people solve their problems based on the knowledge that we produced in Africa. If the knowledge we produce in Africa cannot make a contribution towards solving other people's problems, then it's useless, I would say. So that, that's uh, part of the, uh, that thing I was talking about, provocation, not agreeing with me and all of that. So that is it. Now the other thing is language, of course. And of course, uh, it expresses itself uh, in the form of, uh, you know, how we use language uh, to search for truth, you know, but not just truth, objective truth. So partly what Godwin was saying, that uh, objective truth uh, is the kind of truth uh, that is bereft of all subjectivity, all normativity, all, you know, ethical considerations and so on. So it's been the ambition of social science, actually, uh, to develop a conceptual language that can produce objective truth. And of course, that's something that we can, you know, challenge, we can think about. Mm. And uh, this is where I think we can ask the very important question of knowing uh, whether our language is actually describing the world out there or whether our language is producing the world which we come to see, you know? So it's really about how we are being inducted uh, into seeing the world in particular ways, right? Now, that's, uh, that's a big discussion in philosophy, as you know. Those of you who have done philosophy will be familiar with this, you know? So it's, it's, it's the whole thing about uh, realism, constructivism, um, you know, the correspondence theory of, um, you know, concepts, um, you know, all those uh, sets of issues that are very, very important. And then we also come uh, to, uh, to the issue of values or, or norms, uh, right? So Godwin was saying that uh, we are trained uh, to uh, actually rid ourselves of those things, right? But of course we know that uh, values do not disappear from the concepts. That's the discussion we were having at the beginning of the session here, uh, that uh, we see values uh, speaking to us uh, all the time in technological artifacts, in any kind of artifact. 
And so uh, the question that perhaps we should ask is not whether there are values in what we do, but whose values? Whose values are they? You know, and um, is the challenge for us to replace those values uh, by our own values? And what are our own values, uh, right? I mean, um, we can sometimes be misled uh, into thinking that because we see ourselves as Africans, right, as uh, uh, people who have been addressed in particular ways by history, then we may come to think that uh, perhaps because of that, uh, there are certain values that define us, you know. But that too <laughs> might be a construction. That too might be a construction, right? And of course, uh, that is not meant in any negative way. It's, it's, it's simply a statement uh, of uh, perhaps uh, a, you know, human nature uh, that we always feel this need uh, to uh, relate to other people in essential ways. Right? Uh, so, uh, Godwin mentioned Samir Amin, uh, who was actually the first uh, executive secretary of Codesria back in the 70s and who passed away uh, also sadly recently, I think two or three years ago. And of course, uh, Samir Amin was, was, he was just an exceptional, uh, exceptionally brilliant uh, scholar uh, from Egypt who lived most of his life here in Dakar. Even when he left Codesria, uh, he continued to live here uh, in Dakar. And uh, Samir Amin has written what for me is uh, perhaps uh, the best book on uh, Eurocentrism. And it's called Eurocentrism, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really, um, I, I will share the book uh, with, uh, with you all um, because it's, it's really a fascinating book. Of course, it's Samir Amin was a Marxist scholar so he was right, he wrote the book from that particular uh, perspective. But uh, what he says in that book uh, is that, you know, we react uh, to capitalism uh, by drawing back on provincialism, you know? So capitalism constitutes us in particular ways, right, as marginal, as peripheral, and so on. And our response to that is to actually do what capitalism wants us to do, to emphasize, you know, uh, precisely, um, you know, our particularity. Uh, instead of embracing, you know, the universal, but transforming it. You know, so we embrace and we transform it. Or Kwame Anthony Appiah, the Ghanaian uh, philosopher, once said, so the emperor uh, said to the natives uh, that they should stop walking around naked. And uh, the natives responded uh, by insisting on wearing, you know, um, clothes from homegrown cotton. Yeah? So we are not making a difference. Right? And uh, that's the kind of issue that you can raise in relation uh, with some of the debates that we are having about emancipating ourselves, decolonizing, and so on. You know, we should ask ourselves, what language are we using? And I, I'm not talking about English or French or Portuguese. I'm talking about the conceptual language. You know, how can we claim to be freeing ourselves? You know. Uh, using <laughs> the conceptual language that actually imprisoned us in the first place. You know? do, do we need to develop a new vocabulary? Are we developing a new vocabulary? You know? How sure can we be that the emancipation that we are talking about is actually emancipation? given that the conceptual language we're using is the same. We're just trying to give it a different meaning. You see, one of the things that worries me 
um, in this all, in, in 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 all of these uh, debates is um, you know I feel so uncomfortable when in Switzerland or in Germany or in Europe when I criticize people when I criticize what they say about Africa and they understand me. And I get so worried. Yeah. And, and, and I start thinking, you know, have I really achieved what I wanted to achieve? You know? Um, should I find ways of speaking um, that would place them in the uncomfortable position of not understanding? Because that's the only way I can be sure I'm seeing something new. This is what uh, uh, Kwasi Wiredo, again, passed away also, great Ghanaian philosopher, passed away, I think, last year. You know, he, he used to talk about untranslatability. And what he meant by that uh, was that you cannot translate concepts into a different language. Uh, because to be able to translate, you know, means that you have understood. You know, and understanding is not possible without reaching the point where you don't understand. You have to be able to fail to understand in order to understand. So that's again um, a challenge uh, that we face. Oof. We've talked uh, <laughs> and I've still got a lot of stuff. Uh, to, to share with you. So I'll do that quickly. Um, I wanted to say a few things about uh, knowledge and uh, basically uh, three things. Uh, you know, knowledge is something that has to be thought, in my view, with reference to context, to content, and to the rules that we employ to produce knowledge. What I mean with that uh, is that context always refers uh, to the founding interest, to that thing uh, that made me want to know, right? That's context. Uh, and, and that is what gives the lie, if you like, to the innocence of concepts. Because there's always a context. Social science language uh, social science knowledge, you know, was made possible as far as we are concerned as Africans by colonialism, by the imperial project, by what Sabelo and Lovu Gachin uh, describes as uh, the global imperial project. Right? So if you don't take that into account, you know, you will fail to understand perhaps the other meanings that are entailed in the concepts that you are using to produce knowledge. Yeah. I think the other thing about uh, knowledge, which is also very important, uh, is content. You know, so knowledge is content. Now, what that means uh, is that uh, knowledge is our ability to represent the world in particular ways. That's what content is. You know? So the representation of the world in very particular ways. Now you can call that truth uh, or you can simply uh, place inverted commas around that. Uh, you know. So basically uh, the idea that we produce accounts of things and we somehow assume that uh, those accounts that we are producing represent things in truthful ways. Right? And then we can have a discussion on that. And the final thing about knowledge is that it is only possible through uh, the deployment of rules. 
you know, and some of those rules have to do with how we justify our claims, right? So that philosophical notion of uh, uh, knowledge as justified true belief, right? So how do we justify what we claim? Uh, but also, uh, you know, what are the categories that we deploy uh, in order uh, to produce knowledge or in order to be able to claim that we are producing, uh, we are producing knowledge? So I think those are three things that are very important to bear in mind. And the reason why they are important uh, is because I think that they can help us make a fundamental distinction. Uh, a distinction between values and validity, right? So I think context and content cannot be seen in isolation from values, right? But the rules by which we produce knowledge are less prone to values and more inclined to be approached uh, with reference to the notion of validity. So basically, you know, a technical thing, how we validate our claims. There may even be normative claims, but how do we validate them? You know, uh, so someone was talking about uh, theology, right? So yes, uh, we can validate our claims theologically, but we are subject to rules. And these are technical rules. And we can be transparent uh, about that. So I wanted to, to emphasize uh, that aspect about knowledge, that knowledge is always about content, context, and rules. And I think it's important to make that, uh, those kinds of distinctions in our own work. And that's actually going to be uh, the thing that uh, we will be doing this afternoon. But before we do that, uh, or before I explain that, I also wanted to say something about uh, uh, what we can describe as uh, modes of inquiry, right? And uh, I, I am using uh, technical uh, colonial <laughs> uh, language here. Uh, to uh, refer to two particular modes of inquiry. Uh, so there is uh, uh, what I describe as uh, the Socratic mode of inquiry. So what you do uh, when you apply that particular mode uh, is to inquire into the necessary and sufficient conditions for something to be the case. Hence, the title of this uh, summer school. How political is knowledge? So the invitation there is not for you uh, to say, well, knowledge is political. The invitation is for you to spell out the conditions under which we can say that knowledge is political. So when can we say that? Under what conditions? Yeah. But there is uh, the Euclidean mode, if you like. And uh, this is not uh, about spelling out the conditions, but it is about spelling out the implications of claiming that knowledge is political. So if knowledge is political, what then? You know, what do we do with that? And what can we expect to see in the world if we say that? So I just wanted you uh, to bear this uh, in mind for this afternoon, but also for the rest of the week. Um, it will not be enough uh, for us to simply say knowledge is political. We need to spell out the conditions under which knowledge can be said to be political. And we also need uh, to follow up on the implications of making that claim. So what can we expect out there in our own work and in the world? Okay. So this is just a, a pose uh, for effect. 
Okay, so the effect has been achieved. Uh, so what we are going to do this afternoon is what you see there. Um, I will ask you uh, to split into groups. Um, I think um, uh, there will be rooms uh, for the groups. Um, since we have um, an issue with uh, translation, we will have to, to have uh, linguistic groups, unfortunately. Um, but of course, uh, those who are comfortable in both languages can join any group that they want to join. And uh, what uh, I want you to do in those groups uh, is to first of all discuss your individual work and identify a concept which you think represents the work that you are doing best. You know, so a concept, just find a concept. And then look at that concept bearing in mind those three elements there, the context, the content, and the rules. So I thought we should make it difficult right at the beginning um, so that, um, you know, <laughs> you know what is expecting you. <laughs> You know, like Pan-Africanism. <laughs> oh, I, I like it. I, I like it. Um, uh, Microphone. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I, I like it. Uh, actually, most of the work that I'm currently doing on an individual basis is centered around that. You know, that is the primary thing that makes me thrive for the continent on an ideological basis. Um, on a practical basis, when you look at the context and the reality of the context of the continent, um, it makes it very difficult for you to function within those ideologies. You know, it becomes somewhat um, impossible because in an uh, in in a space of ideology and uh, in a space of um, what do you call this? Uh, uh, conceptual work when you come together like this in these spaces and we try to contextualize and develop ways in which we can um, provoke thoughts and show each other how problematic Western ideas of us and of the continent are. Um, and how the continent in itself, from a historical point of view and perspective, and to what this currently is, is is way better than it's supposed to be. You know, from this situation, it's brilliant. You know, so Pan Africanism in this context is the most amazing thing, and that's what I want. But on a practical level, when you actually get to engage with the rest of the continent, you get to see how fundamentally problematic it is, especially on a political sphere, where nationalism is. Is, is chosen instead of a of a pan Africanist uh, and Africanistic uh, way of existing. You know I, that's why I'm, I'm I'm conflicted in a lot of ways uh, from an epistemological point of view to a practical point of view. It's very difficult. You know so that's why that's what I was saying. Not that I don't I love I am a a, a pan Africanist on a practical level. Also and the work that I center is that. You know yeah. I was not <laughs> blaming you. Okay, uh, look, I've, I've, I've lived in Germany for so many years, half of my life, that I acquired a German discipline. So on our program, it said we finish at uh, half past 12, but actually uh, lunch will only be served at one o'clock. So I programmed my body to go to the toilet at 12.30. <laughs> so uh, what I want to ask you to do now, uh, you know, I'll be away for two and a half minutes. No, two and 40 seconds. <laughs> uh, right. So what I want to ask you to do now, uh, I want uh, like uh, uh, three or four people uh, to 
raise their hand and constitute a group around them for the afternoon. Yeah? But you can also do it your own way, right? Okay, yeah. So just, and then, you know, just check who's going to join you. Uh, pay attention to language, yeah. Okay. Uh, it will depend. Uh, I think if we have four groups, uh, we will, you know, we will have about six people uh, in each group. Six or seven people. Okay. <laughs>